Okay, so how is everyone today? Okay, so a few announcements. So what's today, the, the eighth? No, third. third. So um, today is the last new material that we'll do for the rest of the semester. Um, I had intended on making the written homework for today's lecture already available, but that didn't happen, so I'll I'll do it tonight. But just a couple, just a just a few of them, not a whole bunch of them. All written homeworks are going to be due on Tuesday. No new material will be covered on Tuesday. Uh, rather, we will review. So, uh, please come prepared to review. That is to say, uh, between now and the next class, you need to have looked at all of your quizzes, all of the previous quizzes. <coughs> uh, so, up to quiz 13 should be available to you by tomorrow, I think. So, over the weekend, you need to, to look at all those quizzes and have reviewed and be ready to ask me questions. Um, so any questions about any of that? Yeah? So majority of the exam, it would be quizzes and then all the So there's, there's two parts to the exam, the mandatory part is going to cover written homeworks 67 to the end. So, written homeworks 67 all the way to the end. I think that'll probably be like in the mid 80s, 67 to mid 80s, whatever that is. Okay, and then we're going to have eight exercises over those. <coughs> Other questions? And then the final exam is on Thursday, and the time is just like coming to a lecture, so the final exam will be Thursday, 5.30. Any questions about any of that? Okay. <coughs> Well, last time, what we, what we did at the end of last time is we said that a geometric sequence is any sequence that can be expressed as a n is a multiplied by r to exponent n minus 1 and this is with a is not zero and r is not zero. So the thing that I want you to uh, take away from that, the intuition I want you to have about those, is that a geometric sequence is a sequence that starts out with a non-zero number. And then to get to the next number, you multiply the number that you have by r. That'll always get you to the next number. So listing them all out, the first one is a, the next one is a r, the next one is a r squared, the next one is a r cubed, etc. So such a sequence is called a geometric sequence. Now, that's all fun and everything, but the, the, our primary interest is actually in the next thing, which is the sum of the first k terms of a geometric sequence. So this is, this is where our interest really is. 
So this is denoted as SK, and it would be A plus AR plus AR squared plus dot, 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 all the way to, well, what's the last term? Very good. So that's the last term. So if I gave you a geometric sequence and I said find the sum of the first 300 terms, then in principle you could take that geometric sequence and then compute the 300 terms and then write them all down in a spreadsheet or something <coughs> and then add them all up. So in principle you could do that. But you should not do that. There's a, there's a formula for that, and here's that formula. It is A multiplied by 1 minus R to exponent K, and then divide by 1 minus R. So that's the formula, and we went through a nice derivation to make that happen, to, 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 to come to the realization that that's the formula. <coughs> Okay, so for example, uh, I, could, I could say, so I'm going, I want you to imagine that this part is hidden, that you actually can't, you can't see this. So back in my office, in my hidden laboratory, I've come up with a sequence, and it'll be, 7 multiplied by uh, 4 to exponent n minus 1. And that's unbeknownst to you. And suppose that I say the first several terms of a geometric sequence. are the following. So R7, 28, and then what, 80 plus 32 is 112. So that's the first several terms of a geometric sequence. First request <coughs> is find the formula for the geometric sequence. So there's two parameters in the formula, uh, A and R. That's what we need to find. So how can we find A? It's 7. <laughs> a, on many exercises, A is very easy to find because if you're given the first term, well, that's A. How about R? How do we find R? Right. In fact, you can compute the ratio of any two successive terms. Because remember that the way it works is that to get to the next term, to move one position to the right, you multiply by R. So here to here, we multiplied by R, and here to here, we multiplied by R. So 28 over 7, and that should also be the same thing as 112 over 28, which is the same thing as whatever com ratio comes next, and that's 4. So taking those together, uh, that tells us what's the formula for this geometric sequence. Well, the ratio is 4, but what's its formula?
Well, it'll be 7 times 4 to exponent n minus 1. Okay, then the next question I could ask is, uh, how about find the sum of the first 18 terms? Of that, of that geometric sequence. I'm sorry. Yeah. So would that be like seventeen times one minus four to the power of eighteen over one minus four? Yes, because what we're doing is we take that formula S K. And I'll substitute a, our known a and r in. So substituting those in, that would be 7 multiplied by 1 minus 4 to exponent k, and then over 1 minus 4. And so what we're asking, what's being asked in question 2 is, OK, we'll use this formula with k is 18. That's what's being asked. So S18, that's a job for, sorry? Yeah, some big number. Uh, 7 times 1 minus 4 to the exponent 18. And we're going to do a lot of calculator exercises today. I strongly, yeah, it's a big number. I strongly encourage you to um, do as many of these as possible okay, with your calculator because these calculator exercises are going to be on the final exam and it would be really um, not cool <laughs> if, on the, if on the final exam that's when you first realize, oh, I should have practiced using my calculator. Okay, so please, <coughs> please don't do that. Uh, so, my calculator is saying 1, and then how many numbers is that? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. So my calculator is saying 1, 6, 0, 3, 4, 5, 4, 4, 5, 7, and then I'll have to write 0, 0 because my calculator isn't telling me what numbers those are. No, not that it matters, I guess, when you're talking about a number that big. Any question about this? Okay. So, another one. Uh, not a remark, an example. So the first several terms of a geometric sequence are given by 1, 1 half, 1 fourth, all the way. So first, I want you to find the formula for the geometric sequence. Uh, 2, I want you to find the sum of the first, uh, the sum of the first, I don't know, 10 uh, terms. And now 3, I want you to find the sum of all of the terms.
So the first two are really pretty straightforward. So I'll, I'll go ahead and do them. So can we agree that for, for question one, we need to find A and R? Okay, so then A, I hope it's clear, is one. And then R, what's R? One half, right? Because it's half divided by one, which is the same as one fourth divide by one half, which is of course just half. So taking these two together, the formula is one times one half to exponent n minus one. No, you don't need to write the leading one if it disturbs you. <coughs> Any question about part one? Okay, part two is that S10 should be one multiplied by one minus half to exponent 10 over one minus half. Okay, then that's a that's a calculator issue. <clears throat> so my calculator is reporting the number 1.99804 Okay, now, so part one and part two were just like the previous one, the previous exercise. Part three is slightly, adds a new twist. What is it that you suppose that I'm asking you to do? That's what goes to infinity. K, right? So I'm asking you to compute the limit as K goes to infinity of SK. So is it clear that in the end this is the mathematical request that I'm making of you? Okay, so that would be the limit as k goes to infinity of 1 times 1 minus half to k and then divide by 1 minus half. Well, it kind of, it looks a little complicated, a little bit, but in the end there's only one variable, right? All the rest of the stuff is constant, right? So let's consider that one stays a one, that one stays a one, minus, I'll leave me a leave us a slot there. And then one minus a half, well that's a half in the denominator. And the real question is, is well what, what about this? <coughs> what happens to the thing in the red box as k goes to infinity? It goes to zero, right? Because as as k gets big, half to exponent k gets small because, well, first you start out with, say, k is 1. Well, that's half. And then when k is 2, that's 1 fourth. And when k is 3, that's an eighth. And then a sixteenth. And then a thirty-second, etc. So this thing in the red box goes to zero. So its limit is zero. So one times one is one, and then divided by half. What's one divided by a half? 
too. <clears throat> and this is the subject of a joke. <laughs> so, suppose that, <laughs> suppose that a thou uh, infinitely many mathematicians all go to <laughs> all go to a math conference. And after the math conference is over, they all, they all line up behind each other and go to the bar and the first one says, bartender, I'd like one pitcher of beer. <coughs> and then the next one says, I'll have half of what the person in front of me had. And the next one says, and I'll have half of what the person in front of me had. And then the bartender just gets frustrated and pours two pitchers of beer and says, y'all do this every year. <laughs> so does everyone understand why it's funny? Because <laughs> after all, I'm trying to give you a math exercise here. Right, so the, the, the bartender pours one pitcher and then that one's full and then the next person orders half a pitcher, so half. And then the next one orders half of half which he can pour into that, that pitcher. And then half of half of half, etc. <laughs> Y'all do this every year. <laughs> Good, any question about this? Okay. <clears throat> so, um, now we're going to move to, uh, we're gonna use this geometric sequence stuff and um, some of the first k terms in a, ge in a geometric sequence uh, to talk about a really fairly accurate model for money. Okay, so this thing that we're talking about is called uh, an annuity. <coughs> so this is section 12.2. This is the last new topic for the final exam and it is called annuities. And this is also known as uh, buying and saving. So this answers questions like well, what if you want to enter into a mortgage for a house? And the terms are whatever, whatever, whatever. Well, what you're going to be, what's going to be your monthly payment then? Or suppose that um, you want to have $100,000 in 10 years' time. Well, how much money should you put away every month into an interest-bearing account in order to do that? Okay, so buying and saving, that's what, that's what this this section is about. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> so this is called uh, the future value of an annuity. And I'll have to add one little adjective of an ordinary. annuity. <clears throat> okay, so suppose that we're going to make in sequential payments of amount R and that there is an interest I which coincides payments. So now that's kind of a <coughs> strange way to say something that's pretty natural. 
What I want you to imagine for the purposes of having a mental model is that suppose that you are making monthly payments and that interest is being reckoned monthly. So what we're avoiding is we're avoiding a situation where it's, where it's something like, well, we're making weekly payments, but interest is monthly. Or we're making monthly payments, but interest is weekly. So not like that. It's that interest, uh, the frequency of interest reckoning has to be exactly this, the frequency of payments. OK. The question is, is that if you were to make in sequential payments of amount R with interest I, which coincides with the payments, and if you were to make this into an account, how much money would you have in the account at the end of the, pro at the, end of the procedure? Okay. So, I'm going to draw a picture with there being eight payments. Now, understand that there's, there's n payments, but because I'm drawing a picture, I've got to draw some n, and I chose to draw eight. So we're going to make a payment here, 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 here. Here, here, but not, not a payment on the first mark. So time is going this way. So you can think that it is like one month passes, and at the end of that month, you make a payment. Another month passes, and then at the end of that month, you make a payment. Another month passes, and at the end of that month, you make a payment. So this money right here, this R that you, that you paid, it's going to be in the account for the longest amount of time. Okay, so we're going to carry it forward in time to the end. My question to you is, is how, much, uh, how many periods was this payment in? Seven, right? <clears throat> so the interest is I. So let's imagine here. What if we had, what if we had a thousand dollars, and the interest was two percent? Then after one period, what would be? How much money would that now be worth? One one zero two zero, right? One thousand twenty, because two percent of a thousand is twenty. And that $20 is going to be added in. Another way to say that is that 102% of 1,000 is 1,020. So that means that this single payment, that payment, moved forward in time, is actually going to be R multiplied by 1 plus I. So it's going to be 1 plus I because that's like 102%. And then it's going to be to exponent 7 because it, it accrued interest seven times. It had to go through seven periods. OK. How about this one? It also moves forward in time. And moving it forward in time, what's its value at the end? Right, r multiplied by 1 plus i to exponent 6. So now I think you see the pattern. Okay, so now I'm going to move them all quickly forward to the end.
So that last payment, because it was made on the last day, doesn't, doesn't go through any interest accruals. So we took all these individual payments and moved them all forward in time. So the total value at the end in the account is the sum of all of these, right? It's this one plus this one plus this one, blah, 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 all the way down. Okay, so the future value is the sum of all of these. So we need to add them all up. Now, in the picture, in the picture I did eight. I did eight. But now we're gonna go back to n. But what I want you to notice is because there were, there were eight periods, this one is seven. If there were 20 periods, if I had taken the time to draw all that, this would be 19, right? So if there's n periods, the maximum exponent is what? n minus one. So the sum is <clears throat> the future value in the first place is denoted as with an s and its value is s is equal to uh, r plus r to 1 plus r multiplied by 1 plus i plus r multiplied by 1 plus i squared plus dot 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 plus r multiplied by 1 plus i to exponent n minus 1. Well, do you observe that this is, in the first place, these numbers are a geometric sequence, and this is the sum of the first n terms of a geometric sequence. Okay, so then, what is little a? So this is the sum of a geometric sequence. What is little a? It's big R. And then what is little r? It's 1 plus i, right? And then what is k? It's n. So now we need to take, we need to take our other formula and plug these things in and simplify. So the formula from last time and from two pages ago was sk equal to a multiplied by 1 minus r to k over 1 minus r. So now I'm going to take all these things and plug them all in. So s is, well, little a becomes big R. 1 minus little r becomes 1 plus i, so 1 plus i. k becomes n, so to n. And then divide by 1 minus 1 plus i. So now we've, we've plugged everything in, but now we want to simplify this a little bit. So in the first place, in the denominator, something cancels. What cancels? The ones will cancel, right? And then what, what remains in the denominator? In the denominator. Just negative i. Okay, so now I'm going to make a little change, and you tell me what it was. Oops. So 
So what did I do? And how did I do it? the top, right? So what I, what I use in, in this step, doing this, is I did a step that looks like negative x minus y, distributing the negative in, that makes that y minus x. So I took this negative 1, because I could reckon this as being negative 1 times i, and then moving it to the numerator, and then changing the order of this subtraction by distributing it in. So I'll make one more step. I'm going to factor out the big R and write it like this. R multiplied by 1 plus I to N minus 1 over I. This is a formula that from now on you're expected to memorize. This is called the future value of an annuity. And to be very overly precise, future value of an ordinary annuity. So, one, just a brief comment about the adjective ordinary. So g generally speaking, when, you, when you're making periodic payments and there's interest rates involved, such things are called uh, annuities. The adjective ordinary means that it's structured exactly like this, that you go for one empty month and then you make a payment here at this month and this one 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 and on the last day. And that interest is reckoned at, at the, the, the exact instant before you make this payment. So interest, interest is reckoned the instant before this payment and then this payment is made. Interest is reckoned the instant before this one and then that one is made all the way to the end. So when the sequence of events is just like that, that's called an ordinary annuity. But when you do things like make the payment here and here and here and here but not the last one, or if you change where you're reckoning interest or anything like that, those are, those are different kinds of annuities. They're still annuities, but it's a different kind, and that's not what we're talking about. The formulas are almost the same, but not the same. Good. <clears throat> so any question about this formula? Yes? That's what the book does. Yeah, there's no good reason. N just represents the number, the number of payments. Like, by the end of the class today, we're going to be talking about mortgages and things like that. So a 30-year mortgage with monthly payments, that's 360 sequential payments. So that N would be 360 in that case. There's no good reason to call it N. Uh, so now we can answer a question. Uh, like this. Uh, suppose you make three hundred dollars, you make three hundred dollar uh, payments, monthly payments. into a 4% uh, annual interest rate compounded monthly account. And that you do this for uh, eight years. So suppose you do this. 
you, you decide, that's it, I'm going to start saving some money. And every month you put 300, 300 into the account with those terms. What is the account balance? At the end. Okay. So now, we just have one formula so far today. So by process of elimination, that must be the one that we're using, right? <laughs> now, that being said, the, the name for that, that one formula that we have is called the future value formula. That's its name. What I'd like to point out is what the question is asking. Is the question asking, how much money do you have at the beginning? No, it's saying, how much money do you have at the end, in the future? So this language here, this language here is telling you that you're going to have to use the future value formula. Now I say this because by the end of this lecture, we're going to have three formulas. And you're going to have to be able to read the story and say, Oh, yeah, it's the future value one versus one of the other two. Okay. So here's, here's that formula, just copying it down. The future value is the recurring payment multiplied by this factor. So how many parameters are in this model? There's four of them, right? There's S, R, I, and N. So in order for this to be a legitimate exercise, it must be the case that I gave you all but one of them, and I'm asking you to find the last one. Right? If I gave you a, a model with 47 parameters, then to ask you a legitimate question, more or less, I'd have to give you 46 of them <laughs> and ask you to find the last one. So let's write it down. Uh, S, is this, were we given this, or is this what we're requested to find? That's what we're requested to find. The future value. R, were we given this? What is it? 300. Um, I. Okay, so it's not 0 0.04. Let's think about it for a moment. Not 0 0.04. Now, I agree that it says 4% annual interest. I agree with that. Yes. Because in order for it to be an annuity, it means that the payments and the interest reckon reckoning occur simultaneously. That's why I very carefully and sort of clumsily wrote monthly so many times, right? $300 monthly payments into an interest-bearing account that, that compounds interest monthly. So I is 4% and then divided by 12. So that is um, 0 0.0033 bunch of threes, right? Okay, then what's in? 96. So how'd you get 96? Very good. Because, it's, because this thing is going to go on for eight years, and then there are 12 months per year, so that's 96. So we're talking about 96 sequential payments uh, of $300. OK. So S is 300 times 
1.00 bunch of threes to exponent 96 minus 1 divide by So is there any question why in the end this is what we need to do? So now what we need to do is get our calculator to, to do this. So see, see if you can get your calculator to do it, if you, if you have one. So my calculator is saying. So did any, anyone get it? Very good. So to the nearest cent, 33,875.56 cents. Okay. That's interesting. So for $300, $300 a month, at a, at a relatively modest rate, consi considering that you're just going to let this money sit in the account, which means that uh, you know you can get a you can get a reasonable interest rate if you're willing to not have any access to the money. You can you can save thirty three thousand dollars over the course of eight years. Okay. Any question about this one? So now let's ask the question differently. Suppose that you want you want to have a hundred thousand dollars in twenty years. Okay, you have access to, you have an account uh, that has, I don't know, 6% annual interest compounded monthly. What monthly payment must you make? So now again, we only have one formula, but we're going to have more formulas in a little, in a little bit. The important thing is, is that you have to pay attention to, there's, there's some amount of money that you want, and you have to know when that you want it. So, do you observe that we're saying that we want this amount of money, this $100,000, and we want it 20 years from now? We don't want it now. We want it 20 years from now. Okay, so that means, it says in 20 years, that means that we must be using the future value formula. So again, the parameters, so S, is this something that we have or something we must find? We have, what is it? Hundred thousand. Uh, another parameter is R. Is this something that we have or something we must find? Uh, uh, R. 
This is what we must find. Because it says what monthly payment. Okay, uh, I. We have it. Okay, what is it? Not 0 0.06. Not 6%. Sorry? Yes. 0 0.06 and then divide by 12 which is 0 0.005. Why must we divide it by 12? Right, because it's 6% annual, but, this, but, the, but it, the action occurs monthly. Okay, then N, what's N? 240, because it's 20 years, but then there's 12 months per year, so this is 240. So this is like saying, okay, for the next 240 months, I promise to make a monthly payment. And my goal is so that I can walk into the bank and they'll tell me, your balance is $100,000. What do I need to pay per month? Okay. So now the equation is 100,000 is R, which is unknown, multiplied by 1.005 to exponent 240 minus 1 and then over 0 0.005. Is there any question why this is what must be handled? So we could do this, say, in two steps. I could write 100,000 here is R, and then I could figure that thing out. So that's multiplied by 462.040895 and then r is 100,000 divided by that number Two, 216. Okay. So it's saying that, well, if you saved for 20 years and you put $216.43 into your account, your 6% account, then at the end of that time, um, you'd have $100,000. Okay. And by the way, these num the number 6% is not at all unreasonable. It's really not. Uh, because if you're giving up access to your money for that long, then, then banks are very willing to give you 6%. Uh, in a financial instrument called a CD because 6% is approximately inflation. <laughs> They'll give that to you all day long. <laughs> so I'm not going to even mention inflation, but at any rate, inflation is, is taxation is what it really is. Unvoted for. So, Now, another instance, a more common instance, in which you're making sequential payments is when you're trying to pay off something. Rather than saying, I want to have $100,000 at, at 20 years from now, rather it's something like, well, I have a mortgage payment that I have to pay for the next 20 years. Okay, so then, now what we're going to do is we're going to talk about that. So the way that works, the way that works, if you want to buy a house, say, and just to make the numbers relatively simple, let's say that the house is $250,000. And you don't have $250,000, you have $50,000.
and you go to the bank and say, bank, uh, I like that house you have there. I see that it's 250000 but I don't have 250000 However, I want exclusive access to the property right now. And I'm willing to give you 50000 right now. And the bank says, okay, we'll agree to you having exclusive access to the property, but you must agree to make a monthly payment of whatever. And what's going to end up happening is you're going to end up, so if it was 250000 and you paid fifty, that means that you still owed 200000 you're going to end up paying the bank a lot more than $200,000. And the reason why you're going to end up paying the bank a lot more than $200,000 is it has to do with the fact that you said, I want exclusive access to the property, your property, so that only I can use it and I want it right now. And the bank says, okay, I'll agree to that, but that's going to cost you money because that's convenient to you and inconvenient to me. Okay, it, ha it just has to do with who takes, who takes control of the property at what time, or who gives up the money at what time. Okay, so this is called the present value. of an annuity, of an ordinary annuity. Okay, so the names are all the same as before. So now I'm going to draw another timeline, but with just four, because that's all I'll need to get my point across. But do understand that there's N of them. So we make a payment here of size R, another payment here of size R, another payment here of size R, and another payment here of size R. All of them are transported forward through time, just like we know they were from last time. So this one is r multiplied by 1 plus i to exponent 3. Okay, and then for any n, for any n, the formula here, adding those all together, is r multiplied by 1 plus i to exponent n minus 1 divided by i. Now the question is, the question is, is what if we transported all of this money that's at the end, the future value of the annuity. What if we took all of this money and we transported it back to the very first day, to right here, and we call that, that entire amount of money P. So all of this money now goes this way. If you like, it, it doesn't matter what direction you're actually traveling. So I want you to imagine that the money, that there's two ways to get to this amount. One way to get, this, to, to get to this amount is to make n sequential payments of size r. That will get you this amount. Another way to get this amount is to make one large payment of size p, and then to put it in the account and let it traverse all of the interest payments, all of the interest reckonings. So it goes the whole way. So this picture, instead of, instead of breaking the payments through time, just making one payment at the beginning, it gives you the following equation. It's saying that P, which had to undergo 
in interest reckonings, so it went the whole way, should be equal to the future value, r multiplied by 1 plus i to n minus 1 over i. Okay, so now we're going to take this equation and we're going to solve and simplify for p. So if we want to solve for p, what's the first thing we can do? Well, let me, let me do one thing, because sometimes the algebraic manipulations kind of give students some issues. <laughs> so I'm going, to, um, I'm going to rewrite the right-hand side just a little bit so that it looks like this, r multiplied by <laughs> i plus 1 to n minus 1, and then over i. So that's just a slightly different way to write it. So we want to solve for p. What can we do? Very good. So p is then r multiplied by i plus 1 to n minus 1 and then over i times 1 plus i to n. Okay, now I'm going to factor the r back out. Okay, so now I'm going to divide this thing into the numerator. <coughs> so that P is equal to R multiplied by <coughs> 1 plus I to N over 1 plus I to N, and then minus 1 over 1 plus i to n, and then divide by i. So I took this and divided it into each term in the numerator. So how about that? That simplifies to what? Just 1, right? And then for this term right here, we could, um, I could, we could move this 1 plus i to the numerator, but at the cost of doing what? To get that to come up. Right, you have to negate the exponent. So 1 plus i to exponent negative n over i. Okay, so this last thing here. This is called the present value. of an ordinary annuity of an ordinary annuity it's another formula you have to memorize okay any question about it OK, 
Okay. So <clears throat> here we go. A used car costs six thousand dollars. After a one thousand dollar down payment. the balance will be paid off with monthly payments for three years At 12%, <laughs> terrible, gives me the heebie-jeebies even writing it, 12% uh, annual interest compounded monthly. So the question is, is what is the monthly payment? Okay. <clears throat> so now in the lecture we have two formulas. Here they are. We have that S is R multiplied by 1 plus I to exponent N minus 1 all over I. We have that formula. And we also have this other formula. P is R multiplied by 1 minus 1 plus I to exponent negative N over I. We have two formulas, and you have to be able to look at the exercise and determine which one is the one we're supposed to be using. And remember, in the end, the question, it all comes down to, there is a quantity of money. When are we reckoning this money? Is the money being reckoned now or at a future date? So which one is it in this exercise? It's going to be this one. It's the present value formula. How can you tell it's the present value formula? I mean, I just, we just derived the present value formula. So in, in that kind of sense, it kind of is like, well, it's probably that one. <laughs> but but why, why, is it, why is the exercise saying that it's just got to be the present value? It, it's, not, it's, not has, it's not the current monthly payment, but it, but it is the current value of the car. I mean, the, the way that this works is that if you had 6000 right now, what the car dealer is saying, what that, what that seller is saying is that if you give me 6000 right now, I'll sign over the title, I'll give you the keys, you drive away, it's yours, and you don't have to talk to me anymore. Right now. $6,000 right now. What, but instead you're saying to, to, the, to the seller, you're saying, okay, I don't have 6000 right now. 
I do have 1000 right now, and I'll give that to you, and I'll agree to make monthly payments. But we both agree that right now the car is worth $6,000. So is it clear that the amount of money we're talking about is, a, is an amount of money right now? So as a result of those considerations, we must be using this formula and not the other one. So let's write down the things that we know. So how about P? Is that what, do we know that or are we supposed to find that out? We know it, okay, what's the present value? It seems like 6,000, but it's not. It's 5,000. Why, why is the present value 5,000? Yeah, because we made a down payment. So the, the present value of the car is 6,000, but we paid 1,000, which means that the outstanding balance what is left to be paid, the buyer and the seller both reckon to be $5,000 right now. Okay, uh, how about R? Do we know this or do we find this? We find it. Okay, I. one percent because it will be twelve percent annual but then divided by twelve because the action occurs monthly so that's one percent and then in what is in thirty six because it's three years multiplied by twelve months per year which is thirty six okay So the equation is 5,000 is equal to R, which is unknown, multiplied by 1 minus 1.01 to exponent negative 36, divide by 0 0.01. So is there any question why it, why it came eventually down to this? Okay, so I'll calculate that value real quick. So that's 30.10750. So R is 5,000 divided by that number. So does anyone get it? good 166.07 to the nearest cent so let's make sure that everyone understands the the interaction w what's happening is that you go to a you go to a used car dealership and you say oh I want I want to get that one and the dealer says it's six thousand dollars and what's meant by that is that if you were to give me six thousand dollars right now then I'll, give, I'll sign the title over right now, 
and give you the keys right now and you can drive away and never talk to me again. We can completely conclude our transaction. And then you say, well, I don't have 6,000, I have 1,000 and I'm willing to give you the 1,000 right now and I'll agree to making a monthly payment to you for the next 36 months. And the, the car dealer says, okay, well, since you want to take possession of the asset now, but you don't want to give me all the money now, then that's going to have to include interest, and I would agree to you making 36 payments of $166.07. Okay? So, now, so let's think about this for a moment. You made 36, if you do this, you make 36 payments of $166.07. So how many total payments would you make? So that is to say, let's multiply that 166 number by 36. So that means that to pay off, to pay off the $5,000 that you still owed, you ended up paying about $6,000. And if you add the if you add the other one thousand that you put down, that means that you paid seven thousand dollars for the six thousand dollar car. Now, why does why that why is that not double speak? Why does that make sense? Because you have interest. Because you have interest. It's because you took possession of the asset before having before having paid all of the currency for it. You said, well, I'm willing to give you currency, but through time. Well, when time progresses, currency changes its value. Okay, any question about this? Okay, so let's do, <laughs> let's do everyone's favorite kind of, kind of one. Um, hmm. So he here's another one that comes up a lot, at least for me. Anytime we have like family gatherings or something like that. So you've probably heard of the lottery. It's kind of an exciting topic. You know, everyone, everyone has a friend of a friend of a friend of a cousin of an uncle who won the lottery somehow. Well, for, for lotteries, if you win a $10 million lottery, what does that mean? Okay, so what, what that means is that the Lottery Commission is willing to make out monthly payments to you for the next 120 months, and they're going to end up totaling $10 million. That's what that actually means. So that might mean something like the Lottery Commission will pay you $20,000 a month for the next 120 months. Okay, that's what it means to win the lottery. Unless, unless you check a little checkbox on the lottery ticket that says, no, I want the cash option. So what does the cash option mean? Yeah? It means that, no, I don't, want the, I don't want this monthly payment business. I just want you to pay me one big sum right now. Just give it to me right now. Okay. Well, uh, what, that, what that's saying is uh, it's like asking for the present value of the lottery. So if you win a $10 million lotto, and you also ask for the cash option, they'll pay you out right then and there, but you're not getting $10 million. <laughs> you're going to get something like, probably like $6 million. You know, and then you can cry all the way to the bank, I guess, <laughs> about it being less than $10 million. Okay, because it, it's about when do you get the money? When do you get it? Okay, let's do a mortgage problem. So you want to buy a house. Okay, how much is the house? Uh, 
Okay, 250,000, sounds good. You wanna buy a $250,000 house. How much are we gonna put down? Ten percent. Okay, we'll put down uh, twenty-five thousand. That's ten percent, right? Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what's going to be our interest rate? Three point five percent. Annual interest rate compounded monthly. Uh, compounded monthly. Uh, blah, 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 blah. And what's, how, what's going to be the mortgage term? Is it going to be 10 years? Oh my goodness, we're going to really kill it. Okay, so 10 year mortgage. So mortgages, for, the, for those of you that aren't entirely, that, that, that aren't sure of the way this goes, there are such things as 10-year mortgages, but there's also such things as 30-year mortgages. Okay, so then 10 years is, a, is relatively short. You gotta be, have some pretty good discipline to, to make it through, successfully make it through a 10-year mortgage. Okay, <clears throat> so what is, the, what is the monthly payment? Okay, now my first question to you is that will we, will we be using the present value formula or the future value formula? Present value. Present value. Why, why are we going to be using the present value formula? Remember, you got, you've got to imagine the story. It's who has the asset and who has the money and when does the money change hands. Okay, so what does it mean to, to, see, it, to see a house for sale for $250,000? Does that mean that you would, that you would tell someone, I want, to take act, I want to take possession of the house now and I promise to give you $250,000 20 years from now? No. So that, that's not $250,000 future value. It's $250,000 right now. If you came to me with a briefcase full of $250,000, then right now I would sign the house over to you, <laughs> give you the keys, and we could conclude our business. So, so it's talking about an amount that's happening right now. It, that's, that's, that, that's almost always the case when you're talking about buying something. You go to, the, you go to a car lot, it says $18,000. It means $18,000 right now. You drive it off the lot right now for $18,000. So we're going to use the, the present value formula. Okay, so what's the present value? So P, do we know P or do we find P? We know P. What is P? Very good. Because the, the present value of the house is $250,000, but we put $25,000 down so that what's outstanding is 225000. Okay, then R. Do we know this or do we find this? We find this. I. Okay. 
Let's make it 3.6. That makes the numbers work out nicer. <laughs> Instead of 3.5, I'll make it 3.6. So that would be 0 0.036, and then divide by 12, which is 0 0.2 zeros and then 3. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. And then N. What's N? 120. Why is it 120? Very good. 10 years and then 12 months per year is 120 payments. Okay. So any question how we found these values before we just start using the formula. Okay, well, uh, so P, no, we know P. Two two five zero 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 is R, which is what we don't know, times one minus one point zero zero three to exponent negative one twenty like so. So R is two two five zero 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 divided by that number. So I get that number to be 100.6491931. So the monthly payment is two two three five point four nine to the nearest cent. Any question about this? So this is the reason why most people don't do a ten year mortgage. Because most people most people don't have enough discipline to pay twenty two hundred a month. <clears throat> Let's make a quick modification to this. Uh, if it was 3.6%, that, that's what it is at 3.6%. Let's see, what if we let it get up to 6%? So if we say that that was question one, question two, what about 6%? Annual interest rate compounded monthly. Think about it for a moment. So, let's type it in. Is it going to be, what do, you, what do you all think? The, the monthly payment, will it be? It's going to be more, because you're paying more interest, that's for sure. It's going to be a lot more, a little more. Okay. At 6%, it'd be 
four nine seven point nine six. That's interesting. So going to six percent, that increased your monthly payment by two hundred fifty dollars. That means that that's another two hundred fifty dollars, all going to interest. <laughs> All an interest payment. Okay, now let's think about another thing. We financed uh, um, $225,000. And then how many, and let's go back to the 3.6% because that I think that's currently a reasonable mortgage rate for 10 years anyway. Uh, how many of these payments do we have to make? 120. So let's, let's figure out just exactly how much money left our hand after, after adding up all 120 payments of this size. So that number, 2235.49 times 120. So I'm getting 268,000. So that means that to pay off our $225,000 mortgage amount, that means that we ended up paying $268,000. If you just do a little bit of arithmetic, right? So minus 225 Zero, zero, zero. That means that we paid forty-three thousand dollars in interest. <laughs> yeah. So you're paying forty-three thousand more dollars. Now, one thing that you have to. So some people kind of get upset about this when they finally realize this. <laughs> But you have to take into consideration what occurred. Why, what's accounting for this $43,000? Yeah. You gained exclusive access to that property before you owned that property. That's what that's about. And in the case of a house, it's, an, it's usually an exceptional, and it, supposing you have a reasonable mortgage rate, it's an exceptionally good investment because that means, uh, understand the difference, is that you're going to end up paying rent somewhere. You're going to end up paying your housing cost somewhere. And if you're paying it to an apartment, that means that that money is, is not going toward anything that you own. It's going towards some, what someone else owns. So you're paying 43,000 extra dollars to the bank in interest, but all that time, during that time, you gained an asset that is now worth more than $250,000 because think all property essentially appreciates during time. So yeah, you had to pay $43,000 for the privilege, but now you own it. <laughs> Any question about this? Okay. <clears throat> so now we're going to answer a slightly different question. So I want you to, so we've talked about the, the future value of an annuity and the present value. Future value is answering the question, a question like, suppose I want to have $100,000 10 years from now. That's, that's saying, I want this sum at that future time. So that's a future value problem. When you want to buy something, the transaction is occurring right now. Both buyer and seller agree that at this time, you owe $225,000. So that's a present value problem. So here's an intermediate kind of problem. Suppose that we're in uh, a mortgage, more or less just like the last one that we did. 120 sequential payments. 120 months of paying that, that amount. 
And suppose that we've made it, to, say, to month 40. We've made it to month 40. We've made 40 payments. And suppose that suddenly we have a windfall. Say, one of your, one of your uncles dies and leaves you a bunch of money. Sad, but happy also. For some reason, you've come into a bunch of money. Then you call up the bank and say, Bank, I know that we agreed that I would make 120 payments. And I've currently made 40. I want to know how much would it cost for me to pay right now the entire remaining balance so that I can make this one payment right now and we can close it out. Okay, does everybody understand the difference? It's that we're, we're in a mortgage-like situation. We've made some number of payments. How much is owed right now? if we could just pay, pay off the balance exactly now. Does everybody understand the question? Because it's important to understand the question, otherwise you're at risk of, of getting lost in the mathematical details. Okay. <clears throat> so we'll call this the payoff value. So it's similar to before. So I'm going to draw a, a um, annuity timeline. And to make my point clear, I'm going to need eight or so mini. Okay, and remember that that um, all of these are payoffs. So, so all of these are where the recurring payment occurs, the rent payment occurs. All of these tick marks except for the first one. So let's say that we've paid these three. Those three have been paid. And the rest of these have yet to be paid. So let's say this is exactly three uh, in my drawing. But what I'm going to say is I'm going to call these the X payments that have been made. So the total amount of payments that must be made are n. So if we must make 120 payments, and we've currently made 40 payments, then how many are left? 80 are left. So if we must make n payments, and we've made x payments, then how many payments are left? N minus x. So this is the remaining payments. OK. So the payments that you've made they carry forward to the future in the usual way. These payments that haven't been made, we're going to imagine them carrying forward. OK, 
Okay, so the green payments have been made, the red payments have not been made. So the point in time that you're at, <clears throat> you're right here. You're immediately after you made the X payment number X. And say you've just made that payment, you say, bank, I've just, I've just made my X, X, it's kind of hard to say, payment. And I want to know how much would I have to pay to have no more payments. Well, what you're asking is, you're telling the bank, all of these payments right here, all of these red payments, I want to transport all of them backwards in time to right now. I want to take all of them to right here. What if I was to make a payment Q right here and now? and transport them to right here. Well, <clears throat> how, many, how many interest accruals would Q go through to get to the end of time? Well, it would go through n minus x of them, right? So this, this picture is telling you an equation. It's telling you that Q multiplied by 1 plus i to exponent n minus x, the payment, the payoff amount right now, should be equal to the sum of all of these. Well, this is a geometric sequence. And therefore, we can use the formula for the sum of a geometric sequence. Skipping a few of the algebraic details, it is 1 plus i to n minus x minus 1 over i. So there's two ways to get to this amount of money, either making the sequential payments or making one payment and carrying it forward all the way through all of them. So we've done a lot of algebra today. So I'm going to just skip to the end and say, when you solve for Q, you get the following. So here's another formula that you must memorize. This is the payoff value after x payments. And of course, when x is 0, this is exactly the present value. OK, so any question about this formula? So now let's use it a little bit. So the same mortgage that we did um, two pages ago. So same
mortgage as before. What is the payoff? After the payoff value after one month, one year, and five years. Okay. So what I'm asking you to do is to evaluate the Q formula. So Q is R multiplied by 1 minus 1 plus I to negative N minus X over I. And I'm asking you to evaluate it for three different values of x. Okay. So do this at x is, what's the first value of x? One. What's the second value of x? Twelve. And the last value? 60. Because remember that the thing you have to keep track of is that the payments are monthly. So after one year, you've made 12 payments. And after five years, you've made 60 payments. OK. So on that previous exercise, we had established, sorry, that there was 120 payments. And at least the way the exercise was originally stated, we said that the payment was 2, 2, 3, 5, point four nine. that um, I was 0 0.003, that N was 120. So at x is 1, that would be q equal to 2235.49 uh, times 1 minus 1.003 raised to exponent negative what? 119. This, so is there any question why this is what's being asked for, for x is 1? <laughs> so now here's the disturbing thing, a disturbing thing, uh, is that, so it, it was $225,000. That's how much we mortgaged. And we just made our first payment of $2,200, $2,200, and the bank says, thank you, and they give you a statement, and the statement says what you still owe. <laughs> Let's look at what it says. 2235 Okay. So, yes, if you if you um, do it carefully, you get 
to the nearest cent. So <laughs> if you round that up to 500, it, it's 439, but if you round it up to 500, that means that you were able to take off um, about 1,500 in principle. How much, <laughs> how much went to interest? Uh, about 1,000. Or no, about 800. Because let's think. Take this number, 225000 minus that much. That means that you paid off that much principal. So you, you paid 2235 but you only, you only paid off 1560 in principal, which means that you paid about $700 to interest just then. <laughs> These are actually terrific terms, to be flatly honest with you. If, you. if you could afford to buy a house under these terms, then you should go ahead and do it as soon as possible. Because most, most people's terms end up being more like, okay, I pay $1,600 a month, and this month, of the $1,600 that I paid, 1100 of it went to interest. <laughs> That's more like it, <laughs> which is not funny. <laughs> not funny at all. Okay, interesting. So even on, even on these terms that I'm telling you are actually quite good for a house, you lit literally paid $700 in just interest <laughs> on your first payment. Okay, let's do it again at x is 12. So at 12 payments, you still owe, or if you like, you could pay it off right now for $205,000, $206,000. So that means you've been able to pay off $19,000. And how much money have you actually paid? <laughs> You've paid $27,000. You, you've managed to pay off $19,000 of the house. <laughs> okay. Uh, at 60 months, At 60 months, the payoff value is $122,582.86. And at that time, <laughs> you've paid, you've paid one hundred and thirty four thousand dollars and you've managed to um, pay off about a hundred thousand so you've paid thirty four thousand dollars in interest but suppose that your 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 rich uncle dies at this point and leaves you with one hundred and twenty two thousand dollars then you could pay it off right now Okay. I don't mean to, I don't mean to be a downer in case you've never had these numbers run for you. Um, this is this is the, what it means to buy a large asset, but not be not putting very much capital up front. And that's why if you've ever heard conversations of people around you saying, "Oh, you need to put a lot down, do a lot, put a lot down." <laughs> Good. Any question about this? So again, for these kinds of exercises, 
the thing that you need to remember, the thing that's important, <coughs> is you have to figure out when are we talking about this money? Are we talking about the money now? Are we talking about the money in, in the future, at the end of this process? Are we talking about the money at some intermediate point in the process? That tells you um, what kind of thing, which, which formula you're going to end up using. So let's try a, let's try a few of them. I'll, I'll read the story and you tell me. You, don't say it out loud because I want everyone to try and think about it. But you tell me um, which formula we're going to have to end up using. Okay, so here's the story. Steve wants $20,000 in eight years. What amount should he deposit at the end of each quarter at 6% annual interest, which is compounded quarterly, to accumulate the $20,000 that he wants? So which formula are we going to use for this? The future value. Because it's saying $20,000 eight years from now. Steve doesn't need $20,000 right now. He doesn't need to take control, possession, of a $20,000 asset right now. He needs his bank account to read $20,000 eight years from now. So that's a future value. Okay. Let's think. These are all the same. <clears throat> oh, they're all the same. Yeah, they're all the same. It's all exactly the same story over and over and over again. So, if you wanted to buy, if you wanted to buy, uh, this is UTD. Suppose you wanted to buy an antique novelty $10,000 chessboard. Okay, and you, you wanted to take possession of it right now, and you tell the you tell the the, the seller, well, I don't have $10,000 for this chessboard, but I want to have an I want to have a tournament today, and I want to use that chessboard. And I'm willing to give you 2000 right now. And they say, OK, then I'd be willing to, for you to make sequential payments uh, for the next 36 months to pay off your chessboard. Then which kind of formula are we going to end up using? Present value. Because we're talking about an exchange that's going to happen right now. Right now, buyer and seller both reckon this fantastic chessboard to be worth $10,000 and the exchange is going to occur right now. Okay. Suppose that they come to this agreement of 36 sequential payments and that 20 sequential payments have, m have been made and then suddenly the person says, okay, actually, I'm tired of making these payments and I want to pay it off right now. How much do I owe you so that we can just close it out right now? Which formula? The payoff formula. Good. So any question about any of these? So now this, what we've talked about today, annuities, is actually starting to become a somewhat accurate uh, estimate of the way things are done in real life. Like if you want to buy a house, this is, this is more or less exactly it. Or if you want to sell a house or sell a car or something like that, this is more or less exactly it. Now, if you wanted to manage money, like at, a, like at a bank or something like that, there'd be other issues you ha that have to come in play. So in particular, you'd have to know, you'd, you'd have to be able to calculate what a reasonable interest rate is, for example. And there's lots of things that go into that. Uh, the credit score of the individual, the credit rating of the nation that you reside in, the expectations about inflation, and things like that, all kinds of things come into play if you were trying to figure out what the correct interest rate is. Once the interest rate is decided, almost all of the calculations are exactly what we've done today. Okay.
So any question about any of that? Okay, so one last topic, but you can relax now because this topic won't be on the final exam. This is just something that um, would, would be good for you to know to kind of maybe pique your interest uh, for further mathematical topics. So I have a question for you. If I were to get the calculator right now and type square root of, say, 81, how will the calculator respond? It'll give us a 9. And most students look at that and to say, yeah, of course it's going to give a 9. I know, I know the square root of 81 is a 9. Of course. Okay. What if we write square root of 90? Now what is the calculator going to respond with? <laughs> 9 point something, right? It can't be more than 10. And it's got to be more than 9. 9.48, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So now here's the, here's the thing I want you to consider. Where did the calculator come up with all of those decimal points? Is there some kind of magical uh, square root dust inside of the calculator? And if you, every time you press the square root button, a little bit of this stuff is expended? How does it work? If we were to open this up and look at it with a microscope, what would we see in there? How is it doing it? It's got, okay, I agree. It's got an integrated circuit in there. That'd be, that'd be a good, that, that's a good thought in the sense that we've used differentials to estimate some things kind of like that before. But I specifically chose square root of 90 because that's not particularly close to 9 squared or 10 squared, right? So it, it's 9 away from 9 squared and it's 10 away from 10 squared, so it's not very close. Now we did do things like, well, what's the square root of 122? <laughs> well, it's got to be a little bit more than 11, right? Because 11 squared is 121. So we use differentials in that case. But if you use differentials, then you're only ever going to be accurate to like one or two places. Maybe three if you're real lucky. So how does the calculator do it? Because all of those digits, with the, with the exception of the last one, uh, all of those digits are accurate. That last one may also be accurate, but it's not, it's not for certain. How does the calculator do it? OK. So here's the answer how the calculator does it. Do we have enough time? We don't have enough time to do the whole thing. <clears throat> so how to compute how the calculator computes a square root. So the only thing that the calculator can actually do is it can add, subtract, and multiply quickly. It can also divide, but it does so much more slowly than um, add, subtract, and multiply. So you can kind of think, think of this machine like a device that is able to quickly add, subtract, multiply, and divide. That's what it can do. And when you ask it to compute a square root, what it actually does is it performs probably like 30 or so add, subtracts, multiplies, and divides really, really quickly. It's just so quick these days that by the time you press go, it, it seems like it's already done. But it had to do about 30 or 40 things just then. What is it doing? So suppose you want to compute the square root of b. For some value of b. And you don't know what it is. So let's take an initial guess.
x1. Suppose you have some guess. Well, logically speaking, there's only three possibilities for your guess. You either guessed too low, you either guessed just right, or you guessed too high. That's the only possibilities. So now what I'm going to do, do is I'm going to show you how you could take your guess and get a better guess. Okay? So a better guess which I'll call x2 is equal to the following thing. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you how to get a number from, from your guess to make a new guess that is the average of another guess that's too high and another guess that's too small. So Oops. So let's think about it. Let's think about this thing that I just wrote. Suppose we want the square root of 90, like we just did with the calculator. And suppose that uh, we guess 9. Well, how about it? Is 9 too big, too small, or just right? Too small. 9 is too small. So then 90 over 9, 90 over 9, that's 10. And that would be too big, right? So if our guess is 9, that's too small. This one is too small. And this one is too big. We're going to take that that thing that was too small and this new thing that's too big and then average them to get something that's in the middle. Okay, what if our guess for the square root of 90 was 10? Is that too big or too small? Too big. So that means that this one is too big and 90 divided by 10, that's 9 and that guess would be too small. So again we'd have something that's too big and too small and we'd average them. Well, generally speaking, this is how you get a better guess. Is you take whatever your guess is and then do the following. You got what? Yes, that will happen. So now, 9.5 is now your current guess. Now do it again with 9.5. So suppose we want to compute the square root of 90. And I'm going to do what your calculator actually does. I'm going to guess that the square root is 1. <laughs> that's, that's what your calculator does at first. It says, well, I think it's probably 1. I think it's 1. <laughs> Ah. So I'm going to guess that it's 1. Uh, so x1 is 1. So x2, well, that would be 1 plus 90 over 1 over 2. Okay, so then 1 was the first guess, the next guess is 45 and a half. We're still a little big, right? So x3, that would be 45 and a half plus 90 divided by 45 and a half over 2, which is 23.74. The next one is 13.77. The next one is 
the next one is 9.51. The next one, x7, is 9.48, which is now already accurate, uh, 9.49. And the next one is also 9.49. <laughs> <laughs> to two places past the decimal anyway. This is what your calculator is doing. So I didn't make this up. I'm sorry? I'm not sure like that. Oh, the, the normal distribution? Yeah. That, that's, this is not directly related to that. This thing that we wrote right here, this is called the Babylonian method. Sorry? It, it is exactly what they did, is that people still needed square roots. People still needed them. Even the Babylonians, right? This is, this is back like when, when written language was first a thing. Okay? This, is before, this is before computers, this is before anything like that. Okay? This is like almost, this is, this is at the beginning of agriculture. Okay, the Babylonians came up with this method to compute square roots. And we still use it to this day. And if you were to look, if you knew what you were looking for, and if you were to look inside of this device, you would see a device that is a cascade of the divide and average Babylonian circuit. Blip, 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 blip. And then out comes the square root. Okay, and for everything that your calculator can do, for everything that YouTube can do, all the cat videos. Somewhere, there, all of the cat videos, all the, all the stuff you know and love, is somehow a multitude of add, subtracts, multiplies, and divides. And it's an interesting thing to do mathematically to figure out just how many and in what order of add, subtract, multiply, and divide is it necessary to make the cat make that sound on my video screen. Okay, and this is a simple a simple example of it. Okay, so that's it. Uh, I'll see you on Tuesday.